Welcome to In Focus with Ajaz Heather. We kick off this evening's program with a discussion of Pakistan's first ever cybersecurity policy. policy. The policy was approved last Tuesday by the federal cabinet. But let me begin with an interesting real life story as narrated by Fred Kaplan. And this is in Kaplan's book, Dark Territory, The Secret History of Cyber War. It's about the late US President Ronald Reagan watching a film on 4th June 1983. The film was War Games, starring Matthew Broderick as a tech whiz teenager who unwittingly hacks into the main computer of the North American Aerospace Defense Command, that's NORAD, thinking he's playing a new computer game. He nearly triggers World War III. A few days later, at a security meeting, Reagan, who couldn't get the film out of his mind, asked General John Vesey, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, could something like this really happen? Could someone break into our most sensitive computers? Vesey said, Mr. President, I'll look into it. A week later, the general returned to the White House with his answer. Mr. President, he said, the problem is much worse than you think. This set off a string of meetings and memos resulting 15 months later in a confidential national security decision directive titled National Policy on Telecommunications and Automated Information System Security. Now, this was back in 1983-84. In 2021, cybersecurity and offensives have acquired a whole new dimension. There have been many spectacular attacks, the two most recent ones being SolarWinds hack and Microsoft Exchange servers. One was a supply chain attack, the other a zero-day vulnerability exploit. Both left in their wake immense collateral damage. Cyber espionage is another problem, though it doesn't make the kind of noise cyber hacks and attacks do. Paxson's policy comes in the wake of Indian cyber attacks and the Pegasus zero-click hacks into official phones and networks. The policy establishes a national cyber security response framework and a cyber governance policy committee to implement the policy. It also says that a cyber attack on any institution of Pakistan will be considered an act of aggression against national sovereignty and all necessary and retaliatory steps would be taken. What exactly does this mean? Since the topic is multiplex, I'd like to focus on data protection and privacy both in relation to external malefactors, but also hacks by governments as the Pegasus scandal is revealed, cyber attacks and cyber espionage. And for this discussion, I'm joined by Asad Beg, journalist, computer engineer, and founder of Media Lab, Pakistan's first incubator and accelerator for tech-based digital media startups, barrister Janat Ali Kalyar, who has years of experience dealing with cyber crime, privacy rights and data protection, and Dr. Kevin Curran, Professor of Cybersecurity at Ulster University. Let me begin with Professor Curran here. Uh, Professor Curran, obviously this is almost like, you know, 1984 meeting Huxley's brave new world, but clearly this is not something we can disinvent because there are lots of conveniences attached to this, this digital world, but Simultaneously, as always happens, that's where the paradox sets in, that we also have these problems that we just talked about and in the next 22 to 20, 23 minutes we'll be talking about. So give me a sense of, uh, it's, a, it's a classic dilemma between, it, it, like in the physical world, uh, the, the sort of you know, uh, dialectic between offense and defense. Now, no matter how much defense you, you try and you know, uh, put up, uh, someone will always find a vulnerability. So I guess the debate right now across the cyber community is which do you prefer? Do you prefer to defend yourself? Do you want to acquire offensive capabilities and raise the cost for hackers, whether they are non-state groups, uh, or individuals, or whether they are governments? Exactly. We know that the next world war will be fought by keyboard warriors without a shot being fired because most of our infrastructure, our critical infrastructure, and most of our do is all online. So without having to cross into any country, you can cause havoc and destruction by attacking the digital infrastructure. Um, again, so we're just seeing a, war, a world where in the past, the difficulty, of course, with cyber attacks is attribution. How can you be sure one country 
has actually attacked another. So some countries could look, make attacks look like they came from China in order to cause the US to re retaliate and vice versa. Again, what protected us in the Cold War when it came to nuclear war, you know, the, the threat of nuclear war between Russia and the United States was, was what we call mutually assured destruction. So if one country fired a nuclear missile at the other, the other was going to fire a nuclear missile back at it. So therefore, neither country wanted to be to do that. But when it comes to cyber warfare, again, because we're dealing with digital bits, we have techniques which allow you to obfuscate which country you come from. You can make the language look like it was written in some dialect. It is so much more difficult because the last thing you want is to attack a country in an offense cyber warfare and the country not having done it because they will retaliate and we just end up with chaos again. So when it comes to digital warfare being offensive defensive, of course, you have to have defensive abilities, but you also have to have offensive abilities if you're one of the larger countries. You have to be able to attack back. Otherwise, they will just take all your secrets, go through your documents, whatever else, whatever they, they need, whatever trade secrets they need. So you have to have a threat of offensive capabilities. Now, we don't know how much resources the larger countries put into offensive versus defensive, because it's very hard to tell how much a country puts into their cyber warfare teams. In the past, if you wanted to see the military power of a country, you use your spy satellites, you count the tanks, you count the ships, you see how many people are training. But with cyber warfare, it's almost impossible to, to, to figure out how much resources a certain country has for offensive and defensive cyber warfare. Absolutely. This also uh, sets up the discussion nicely with reference to um, what the Pakistan cybersecurity policy uh, says. And uh, Asad Beg, uh, any attack will be considered an attack against the, the sovereignty of Pakistan. Now, as Professor Karan just mentioned, uh, it's extremely difficult uh, very often to actually trace back an attack. Um, and, and you know this because you're the techie here. And, and so, uh, what kind of response uh, do you think Pakistan could generate? And I, I ask this also because Pakistan is nowhere in the top league uh, when it comes to cybersecurity or cyber experts. I think mainly there are two things that we need to consider here. One, that cybersecurity policy that we are talking about, it can be divided into two main objectives. One, the security of the critical infrastructure of any country, in this case Pakistan, and which means the infrastructure, the technical infrastructure that deals with the critical function of the state. Uh, and two is the data protection and privacy of the citizens of Pakistan, which to me obviously is as, uh, as important as the first part. So these are the two major things that I think any cyber policy or cyber uh, security uh, uh, design should deal with. Now, the question that you asked, Jasta, it's it, so we are living in a digital age and putting uh, a geographical sort of location to every attack and like simply tracing back the geolocation of, a tra of, of, of an attack where it's coming from, it's difficult. So uh, and think about it like this. For instance, anybody who is trying to attack, let's say, the infrastructure of uh, Pakistan or any, any, or any other country can very easily outsource this task to any other country or any other group sitting, let's say, in another country. So to actually trace back uh, the whole sort of system and, and so on, it's difficult. In my view, the best uh, design that we can work on as, a, as as Pakistan as a country is a defensive design and that I think uh, with this policy this this should be the first step towards that design now I'll, I would also quickly like to talk about some of the key uh, aspects of the policy if you have time and whenever you ask me a question I'll be more than happy to sort of respond to that specific part right um, right uh, I think that that's a, that's a good idea but let me uh, pull in uh, barrister Kalyar here. Uh, since we're also talking about uh, data protection. Now, data protection, uh, obviously, there can be, uh, you know, malefactors, as I said, uh, you know, uh, non-state actors, hackers outside. But we've also seen, uh, because of this Pegasus scandal, that there have been governments, including some democracies, <laughs> like Mexico and, and India, uh, that acquired uh, this technology and uh, the software, spyware, uh, call it what you will, 
and uh, actually uh, spied on their own citizens, um, journalists, uh, activists, uh, uh, legislators, opposition leaders, dissidents. So, so data protection also becomes a very crucial aspect, of it, as, as Asad also mentioned, and I completely agree with him that it's uh, as important an aspect of the cybersecurity policy as uh, the other aspects. So give me your sense, since you've worked on this, give me your sense of where we stand up until now in terms of data protection. In line with the rest of the world, we've seen a global trend towards the adoption of data protection laws. And in line with that, Pakistan uh, has, uh, just last year, uh, they proposed a recent iteration of the Personal Data Protection Bill 2020. And uh, it has yet to be tabled before the parliament. It was proposed by the Ministry of IT. and. Uh, like I said, we do not have a data protection law at the moment. Uh, the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act or the cybercrime law that we have uh, in place at the moment does indirectly, uh, uh, it does contain certain provisions that do criminalize unauthorized access to or interference with uh, critical infrastructure or uh, information systems, but it does not... Uh, have any specific provisions that deal with uh, citizens uh, seeking recourse against data breaches. So uh, the personal data protection bill that I just mentioned was tabled last year. It does uh, empower citizens to a certain extent. Uh, it does give them certain control over how their data will be used, who will use it, and for what purpose. And it does hold uh, uh, private bodies uh, or companies and even public bodies and state institutions accountable in case of any wrongdoing. But uh, And obviously, there are a lot of shortcomings uh, uh, with regards to the bill that I will be happy to discuss uh, but uh, like I said, uh, at the moment, we do not have a data protection law, so there's no uh, recourse that we have as such. And if, for instance, uh, my data is compromised by any state in institution, it could be NADRA or the Pun Punjab Safe Cities Authority, or uh, any private body, such, a, uh, such as a company that uh, has a ride-sharing app, such as Karim or Uber, because there have been recent uh, data violations by them, uh, there's no recourse. Um, I, there's no recourse, or there's no law as such. Right. So, so a, a, uh, quick, a, a quick follow-up. Now, it's one thing to do the bureaucratic thing and, you know, draft a law. Uh, but that in and of itself uh, does not really mean, uh, you know, smart enforcement or implementation. So that's, that's one thing. Secondly, uh, since I mentioned Pegasus, as a spyware, a zero-click, uh, you know, spyware, and, and governments have used this, uh, now there's enough evidence of that, so uh, those uh, who were impacted by it, they didn't even know that they were, they were vulnerable or they had been compromised. So uh, you, know, you don't even get to the point where you actually realize that you're being wronged. So that's another problem here. This is something that I'm going to take back to uh, Asad and Professor Karan also, but I want to get your take on this first. So uh, we also need to understand when we talk about uh, uh, infrastructure and capac uh, capacity of uh, our law enforcement agencies. Now, uh, the FIA, or the Federal Investigation Agency, is a designated body under the cybercrime law, which should be investigating uh, such uh, cases. However, they do not have the capacity to do that. And they're uh, under-resourced and they're overburdened with a lot of other cases that are more personal in nature, such as harassment and blackmailing, and they have no experience, and I'm not aware of a single case of this nature that they have worked on or if they have the capacity to work on it. And it's very important, and it goes to show how important it is to have uh, you know, computer emergency response teams and infrastructures in place, because you cannot uh, enforce a law otherwise, especially a data protection law or a cybersecurity law. And it's also important to highlight that the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act does contain a provision whereby the federal government can constitute a computer emergency response team uh, that will uh, help in investigating these complaints. And if uh, there is such an attack, they will uh, you know, investigate that, but it has still not been constituted. All right. Uh, Professor Karan, uh, you heard uh, these issues. So it's one thing to be cognizant of the fact that you know, there are these vulnerabilities and quite another 
to be able to prepare yourself at various levels uh, to actually counter them or to defend against them. Now, the reason I say this is that, of course, we know that the United States, uh, some of the countries, Israel included, the UK, Russia, China as dedicated teams, uh, are world leaders in many ways. And yet the United States uh, at various levels has been extremely vulnerable to these attacks. So, so my point is that uh, even with a very high degree of expertise, uh, it becomes difficult to actually, uh, because you know, the, 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 almost everyone, hospitals, schools, universities, uh, you know, departmental stores, buses, terminals, electric grid, everyone is using networks, these computer networks. And it's extremely difficult to have some kind of umbrella organization that can actually provide security to everyone. Yes, but the, the number one thing all countries need to do is set up a national cyber agency, cyber security agency. So the UK, for instance, have the National Cyber Security Center and all um, threats and anything that happens from businesses and obviously from government go through there. It's a one stop shop. Um, and it's the way to look at every country should copy Israel's model, figure out what Israel do, pound, you know, person per person per population. No one touches Israel for security because it's in their genes. They're, they're born to be warriors and they brought that into the cyber warfare space and they are exceptional. Um, they have the most for per capita, the most startups in cybersecurity. What they did was take it seriously. You know, they had a national cybersecurity agency. Then they put money into developing business support for cybersecurity companies within the country. They also worked with universities and, and set up dedicated cybersecurity centers and research policies and have them work with industry as well. They also launched many any national education policies to try to encourage young people as well to go into science subjects and cybersecurity. And they also provided access and funding as well. And so forth. you know, that's where most of the cybersecurity companies are existing right now from Israel again, and there's, they're not a large country. So again, we can use them as a model. And of course, the big software came from the NSO group, which are Israeli based. And you can bet your bottom dollar that, of course, the government, the Israeli government, were getting intelligence from the NSO group. I mean, it's 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 a beautiful model. They have a company which sells software to dictatorships and other governments around the world, not just dictatorships, but sells it so that these countries can spy on their people. And then the, all the information gets back to Israel as well, because they're monitoring their, their threat actors as well all the time. So again, there will always be data breaches, always will be. The, you know, this the is bad this guy, is, the hackers this is only bad, you. I mean, yeah. What you're saying, this is like the the you know the digital uh, equivalent of the longest running and the most successful second uh, operation by uh, joint operation by the U.S. and uh, German BND, which is the crypto AG uh, op Rubicon. Uh, so, so you basically saying that everything that the governments that had bought the NSOs uh, spyware, uh, everything that the data that they were collecting was also going back to Israel. For sure, for sure. Wow, well, that's, for that's sure. yeah, that, yeah, I, I thought so. Uh, on that note, thank you so much. That was Professor Kevin Curran speaking with us. Back to Asad Beg. Asad Beg, you heard that the the model to be emulated is the Israeli model. And you also heard uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the, the startups, tech startups. And so it's not just about, as I said to uh, Barrister Kaliar, it's not just about a few bureaucrats, uh, you know, uh, uh, drafting a, a, a policy or a, or a law. It's about uh, uh, an effort at a national level uh, to and and a, in a holistic way, if if cybersecurity is indeed something that we're going to take seriously, then uh, we need to approach it differently. Oh, I couldn't uh, agree more with you on this, honestly. And this is really the crux of the matter. If, if and if I may, to sum up uh, the conversation in three recommendations, one that I said this document is a starting point. Uh, definitely. I mean, you cannot be just done with it by saying that, oh, we've created a policy and that's all we're going to do. One, we need to have a localized, dedicated department in Pakistan that deals with cybersecurity policy. I cannot emphasize enough on this matter because currently, like uh, Janat pointed 
pointed out that the only investigating agency that we have for cyber crimes mm -hmm. is FIA, and they're already massively overburdened, and uh, they don't have a lot of resources, unfortunately, at this point. So, uh, if 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 I'm to come up with three recommendations, point number one would be to have a dedicated department with excellent people leading it that uh, implements this cybersecurity policy, because uh, until we have that. It's just a document, and it'll remain a document, unfortunately. The second point I'm going to focus upon is, uh, is the fact that we cannot, by any means, stop all of the attacks that are coming our way. And you rightly pointed out, even the US, uh, you know, the whole Russian influence that we see in the 2016 election, then we see the hacking of various departments just recently um, happening in, in, the, in the US and so on. So, so it, it, it's important that we understand that we are not going to stop of all of the attacks and they're going to happen. A national campaign for the implementation of all of the cyber policy and other documents related to cyber policy in the local departments, because essentially we are talking about the critical infrastructure. In the first point, we're talking about the critical infrastructure. Now, what exactly is that? Any and every institution in Pakistan that deals with public data, in my view, is, is critical infrastructure. Now, starting all the point, all the way from Nadra to PIA and to all of these other institutions. Now, imagine having a cyber security model being implemented in PIA. And, and, and I'm just saying this because the challenges that comes to my mind, the bureaucratic challenges that comes to my mind, they're massive. And they're uh, obviously, you know, tens of other departments that I can think of which will have similar bureaucratic problems when you're implementing similar policies in them. So these are the things that we have to deal with on a national level. It, it's not just going to be a one-off effort. Unfortunately, it has to be a very sustained effort if we ever want to be able to defend ourselves from the cyber uh, attacks that are coming our way and will come our way in the, in the coming years. Absolutely, uh, I should plan a, a program, a longer program, uh, you know, dealing with this issue and uh, get a few more experts to talk about. But these are these are excellent recommendations, and, and I'm happy you made them because uh, I, I want the program to actually generate uh, uh, points for further discussion. Uh, but before I wrap up, let me go to um, uh, Janat Kalyar here. Uh, so you, uh, Ambassador Kalyar, you talked about the, uh, you know, the FIA. You talked about the lack of capacity, the the fact that they are overburdened. You also spoke about, uh, you know, the various lacunae in in the cyber crimes law. So just uh, to sum up, uh, in terms of the positives, a quick sort of tabulated positives and negatives of the legal infrastructure uh, or, or the framework that we currently have. So to understand the cyber legal landscape and if it uh, provides sufficient protection uh, to data, now I think it's important to understand uh, how data has different categories. And uh, so the data that belongs to citizens uh, uh, is personal data or sensitive personal data that falls under the regime of a data protection law that we don't currently have. Correct. And then the critical uh, da data of critical nature or critical infrastructure, uh, to address any interference with that, uh, we do have certain provisions of the cybercrime law that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, have not been very effective because uh, I'm not aware of any cases that have been sort of investigated or prosecuted uh, under those specific provisions. Uh, so at the moment, uh, there isn't sufficient protection. However, uh, there's another recommendation or another, I would say, a shortcoming in the current uh, legal landscape, which needs to be highlighted, that there are certain uh, provisions under various laws. So we have, uh, under the PTA Act, we have certain provisions that um, deal with how uh, telecom companies uh, should deal with the data that they have. And then under PICA, uh, or the Prevention of Electronic Crimes Act, uh, uh, certain service providers, they are required to retain traffic data of their users. And then we have uh, you know, all of these uh, provisions in different sets of laws, and they're not consistent with each other. So yeah, there's a that's lot of a, that's a, that's a, and I'm happy you making this point. I'm just fast pacing it because I've run out of time. But uh, so lots of these are not consistent with each other. So that's another uh, another area that needs to be looked into. Um, and of course, uh, on the technical side, 
uh, what, uh, you know, if we if we want to have a policy and then how to implement that, uh, which Asad Bayek talked about. Well, I, I suspect, as I said, that you know we uh, I'll have to revisit this um, sooner than uh, later. But for now, thank you so much, uh, Asad Bayek. Thank you for your insights, uh, the Barrister Janat Ali Kalyar. Thank you for your insights. We shall take a short break and return to discuss a threat by Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett that while Israel would like collective action against Iran, it could also go alone if required. Stay with us. Welcome back to In Focus. Israel is rallying global action against Iran over an attack on an Israeli managed tanker tanko off Oman last week. However, according to Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, if necessary, Israel is capable of responding on its own. Bennett made the statement on Tuesday. The United States, Britain and Israel have blamed Iran for the suspected drone strike on the tanker last Thursday, which killed two crew members, a Briton and a Romanian. Tehran has denied any involvement. To discuss this further, I'm joined by Sayyid Vahkosh in Tehran. Mustafa is a journalist and analyst who has taught at a number of Iranian universities and academic centers. Ramzan Ona Erem, author, political scientist, and president of Dragoman Strategies, also joins me from uh, Istanbul. Thank you to both panelists. Let me begin with Mustafa Khosh So, Mustafa, uh, the, the Israelis are saying, look, we've got all the evidence, and we're going to present this. Uh, to, to other countries, and presumably they have also shared it, uh, whereas Tehran has said uh, it has no hand in this drone strike. So give me your sense of uh, where this is likely to go, because you know it's, it's created another sort of round of uh, uh, accusations and counter-accusations between Iran and Israel. To realize or to uh, assess uh, future development, present developments in the you know, you know, predict future. We need to know uh, the reason and the motive of the Israelis because they have never uh, presented any corroborative evidence to prove that Iran has been involved in this ship attack. But uh, honestly, the Israelis, they've been uh, attacking Iran in the past couple of years through proxy forces or they've been conducting sabotage against uh, Iranian facilities, nuclear facilities, uh, risking radiation of large population in Iran. And also they have been assassinating Iranian nuclear scientists, Dr. Fakhrizadeh, and they have done a lot more. And they've been bombing Syria. In the last case scenario, I mean, in the last case, they bombed Syria and killed uh, two top commanders of the resistance from uh, and then when you kill top commanders, no matter who they are from, where they are, um, you need you you have to pay the price. So uh, they they came under attack by the resistance front, as a matter of fact. And also, they've been conducting assassinations and terror against Iran. Let's remember that they, the facility that they attacked, the nuclear facility in the pants, is under the constant monitoring of IAEA. Iran is a member of the IAEA, and it's a secretary to the MPD. And it's come under attack by Israel that has hundreds of nuclear warheads. It's not um, uh, under any kind of international supervision. And then uh, if the UN and the IAEA had taken their you know, responsibility and punished Israel, uh, then uh, the case could have been different, but they have not done anything to punish Israel and left Iran uh, uh, with no other option but tit for tat. So when the Israelis started attacking, you know, Israelis and Americans have attacked 12 Iranian tankers and trade ships in the past one year, and the global community is not doing anything, um, then uh, uh, the Israelis uh, are actually escalating the situation for a number of reasons. First of all, they feel they are incarcerated and under siege on occupied territories from north, south, where, uh, from Lebanon, Syria, Gaza, everywhere. And then they don't feel secure inside even. So they have started a plan in order to transfer hotbed of tensions to lands and territories and waters adjacent to Iran in the Persian Gulf and Sea of Oman 
also to north, the territories north of Iran, like Armenia and Azerbaijan, Israel has reinvigorated its presence in those states. And also a second reason uh, is that the United States containment strategy failed. Uh, it, you know, the, the containment strategy stands on two main pillars, two main weapons of sanctions imposing credible military threat. And after triple incidents in the Persian Gulf, the last one being the masterpiece of Iran, the Iranian missile attack on Ain ul uh devastating the American air base, uh, the American threats are no more credible. They cannot change the calculations of decision makers in Iran. Therefore, the Americans tried to mend this problem, and they called in Israel in order to take action to increase credibility of threats. That's why Israelis have been conducting more and more attacks. The goal, the objective, is pressuring Tehran in Vienna talks to give in to uh, the U.S. excessive demands, okay. especially with a Raisi president uh, in, uh, having Raisi in office. They know that Iran will be tougher on them. So they are right. trying to preempt Iran. They are trying to push the region in, in the Persian Gulf into tension and turmoil in order to justify okay. uh, you know, their presence and win a UN Security Council resolution by rallying the international support in order to establish more active presence in this region to pressure Iran. Right. Um, now, just to corroborate uh, what Mustafa is saying, uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has predicted a collective response to the incident, which British Prime Minister Boris Johnson described as an outrageous attack on commercial shipping. Let me pull in uh, Ramazan Erem here. Uh, Mr. Erem, uh, you've heard Mustafa Khosh uh, He's talked about this particular incident, but also sort of linked it with, um, with uh, you know, the U.S., Israeli, and other strategies to try and pressure Iran. Now, uh, Yossi Khan, uh, who was the former Mossad chief, uh, he actually gave an interview in which he talked about, not directly, but indirectly referring to Israeli actions against Nathans and also its involvement in the assassination of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. So give me your sense of uh, what does uh, Naftali Bennett mean uh, when he says that if necessary, Israel could go alone? Bennett is obviously, uh, you know, is, is being outspoken right now, being the, rather new, the new prime minister of Israel, uh, is, is actually stating out the facts. Uh, you're talking about a, uh, a terrorizing state for the region for many years, uh, where it, had, uh, it has and still does enjoy the, uh, the unconditional support of the United States and most of the West, uh, Western Europe and uh, does uh, whatever it wants and whenever it wants now in the recent uh, couple in the recent year years or so uh, it has also unfortunately has been getting the uh, somewhat of unconditional support of the uh, of the arab uh, nations uh, surrounding it unfortunately and these are predominantly well almost overwhelmingly uh, you know, Muslim nations as well, which is which is sad to see, and then sad to observe. Uh, but uh, what ha what should happen in in a perfect world, and we're nowhere near that, is that such claims by any nation, then that should include Israel, if there's any validity to it, you take your uh, proofs and you take it to the uh, you take it to the UN, whether to the General Assembly or or to, or to the uh, Security Council. But that's where you resolve these things. You don't, as Israel has had the uh, uh, the luxury of of doing this for years. You don't do this unilaterally. You don't just say, "Oh, this is what happened," and here are some of my uh, you know friendly, new friendly nations around me, and here's the United States and and Western Europe approving this, and then take action accordingly. This is not how international disputes, if there is, uh, are resolved. What this, uh, what Bennett is trying to, I guess, portray is that, uh, you know, being a new prime minister, uh, kind of showing, I guess, his own personal power uh, on being on top of the, uh, the government, uh, on, on top of the uh, Israeli government, and trying to show off his, uh, his uh, weaponry power. I mean, um, it, there's no, it's not secret that uh, the air dominance in the area against Iran 
uh, and the air superiority uh, probably is overwhelmingly on, on the Israeli side, especially with their new uh, friends around them, uh, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, and, and whatever have you, uh, also in, in the region. So so he's trying to show, I guess, this is his own power, being, being the new prime minister. But again, this will only add more uh, tragedy into the region. Uh, and the West, especially the U.S., is uh, is going to this fire with, uh, not to put it out, but to even make it a bigger fire, uh, trying to demonize uh, Iran against the uh, against the rest of the world. Right. Uh, so a quick follow-up question before I go back to Mustafa. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, the Biden administration really wants to get back to the joint uh, comprehensive plan of action, the nuclear deal. On the other hand, uh, you are arguing that the U.S. is kind of fanning the flames of the fire instead of trying to put it off. So uh, how, how would you square these two, uh, two actions? I, to me, it's not surprising uh, because uh, from day one, the Biden administration has not had uh, really one straightforward policy when it comes to international, uh, um, you know, hardship uh, cases of, of hardship. Um, I don't think that uh, Biden's administration or Biden himself can afford to do anything to um, to you know sort of uh, hurt uh, the U.S. Israel relationship, but at the same time, I'm sure there are some people in, in in with with their with their rights set of mind in that administration that uh, Iran is uh, the well, only one of the two um, nation states in the region. Uh, it has a it has a long history. It has a, a very strong presence, and no matter how mighty. Uh, you know, with firepower, the Israel may be. Iran is not a country that you, uh, quote unquote, you want to mess around with. So um, I, I guess they're trying to. Uh, Biden is trying to play, to to a certain degree, the better of two sides, trying to come up with a win-win situation out of this. But the way they are they're doing this, uh, being only uh, seen at least as as a one-sided uh, fans of of the state of Israel, uh, it's not going to go nowhere. At this point, uh, where as I said before, the unfortunate, uh, unconditional support of countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia seem to be on the Israeli side, the people of the region, uh, and I'm sure by experience about this are nowhere near supporting Israel and it is uh, vindictive, uh, you know, uh, aspirations in the region. Uh, this may go for some time, but in, in the in the midterm or the long term, this will backfire to Israel and it will actually probably backfire to to United States and to the rest of the Western Europe as well. So um, doing these, uh, tr uh, you know, small tricks to get an upper hand so to speak, in the region for Israel uh, in the midterm and, and the long term will not uh, pay any credit to the peace and stability that this region is, is so long, you know, seeking for. Right. Uh, before I up, let me go back to Musla Khosheshm. Musla, you heard what uh, Ramzan Aram uh, had to say, and, you know, so he, he's making uh, some very important points. Uh, but one with reference also to domestic politics where Naftali Bennett, uh, who used to be uh, uh, Netanyahu's protege and then dislodged him, uh, probably wants to sort of flex his domestic political muscles also. But apart from that, given that uh, Israel has a history of uh, acting against Iran, uh, including on Iranian soil, um, is this something that Iran will take seriously, uh, this sort of veiled threat, or do you think it's just bluster? Uh, definitely. Uh, let's remember that uh, the Israelis um, are playing in a space uh, somewhere between war and peace. Uh, but they don't dare to launch war against Iran because they know Iran's power. Uh, you know, the United States and its allies, they are pressuring Iran and they have done anything they could to, to, to uh, slow down the growth of Iranian missile industry. One of the reasons that they won JCPOA is that they have a detailed planning you know, to contain Iran's power components in three phases of slowing down, stopping and rolling back uh, the growth of Iran's 
power in the nuclear industry, missile industry in the region. And one of the main reasons is Israel. Israel is afraid of Iranian allies uh, also. Uh, they know that, uh, as they put it, they claim that Iran has three layers of uh, frontiers stretching from Lebanon to Syria in layer one, Iraq and Yemen layer two, Iran itself in layer three, uh, and, and they could launch attacks, thousands and tens of thousands of missiles on Israel. So they don't dare to go for war against Iran now, but what matters to them is that they want to strike and hit and run uh, and conduct uh, operations, sabotage operations, in order to lay increasing pressure on Iran, in order to push Iran to, in, uh, uh, to the talks and, and uh, make Tehran give in to the U.S. excessive demands in uh, various areas, including missile industry. But I do believe that the Israelis will eventually do some kind of miscalculation and cross the red line one day. And Iran is very serious in providing them with a response. And the response is not a contained war. It will definitely be a full-fledged war once they cross the red line. Right okay. now, they've been conducting attacks on Iran, and there has been a tit-for-tat, attacks on ships, attacks on sensitive centers, military centers, whatever. There has been a tit-for-tat uh, you know, pattern. But if they take the actions that they have worn, and now they have recently not been shy of, as you just said, of not you know, uh, uh, hiding uh, their attack. And they, they have not been shy of acknowledging uh, their responsibility uh, uh, in terrorist attacks against Iran. So uh, gradually we are witnessing escalation of tensions and Israel is responsible. And if they don't stop, I believe one day soon, very soon in future, maybe uh, in, in, in a matter of months or weeks, uh, if uh, uh, maximum this year or the next, they will cross the red line because this is the pattern. They are escalating tensions and there'll be and a there'll be a grave there'll be a grave miscalculation and it'll have uh, major negative consequences for the entire Greater Middle East and this region. Um, and I suspect that this is something that we will, unfortunately, I must add, uh, be revisiting again. But thank you so much to Ramzan Ona Aram for his insights. Uh, it was great to have you on the program, Mr. Aram. And thank you also to Mustafa Kosheshm, as always, for his insights. This is all from In Focus this week. We shall see you next Monday at the same time. Keep following our latest updates on social media at Indus.News. Good night and goodbye. Thank you.